Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Staff and patients want seamless communication. How can your ASC improve workflow and satisfaction? I'm Alan Conlon with Becker's Hospital Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to David to introduce himself and begin today's presentation. Hello, my name is Dave Kornikevich. Good morning, everyone. I am an orthopedic surgeon in Goshen, Indiana, and I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, text messaging today. I have no disclosures or conflicts to report. I'm here to talk about secure messaging and how it made an impact in my practice and our patients here in Goshen. It's a fact that text messaging has changed the way people communicate today. Offering secure text messaging options to staff and patients provide an opportunity to expand on this common and popular form of communication. I think it's probably the most common way people communicate today. The last time I looked at some information, they said 23 billion texts were sent a day or that's about 270,000 texts per second. I don't know if that is national or around the world, but that's still a lot of texts uh, that are being sent. But in healthcare, uh, it's still an underutilized option. Secure text messaging isn't as, has not flourished as much as regular text messaging among uh, patients and nurses and hospital organizations. So, Studies have shown that good physician communication and physician-patient uh, satisfaction can be uh, a positive factor in taking care of any patient. Uh, if we improve physician-patient communication, we can improve outcomes and patient engagement. If we improve engagement, we ultimately can lead to better compliance for our patients, such as medication and compliance with our plan, and a more satisfied patient experience when that happens when they're healthier. Having an engaged, compliant patient should improve their health and enhance both the physician and the patient's satisfaction. If physicians have job satisfaction, then there's less chance of burnout, which is a pretty big issue that we, we see today in our world of medicine. So why utilize text messages with our patients? Well, number one, patients are familiar with the technology. No real Education has to be given to the patient on how to use text messaging. It's a common part of our patient's normal routine, a common form of communication, and again, probably the most common form that we see. It's increasing popularity and probably is the most popular form. And of course, it's preferred method of communication for millennials, which many organizations are trying to capture uh, in, uh, in their uh, healthcare uh, system. As I mentioned earlier, text messages has changed the way we communicate. If you look at the evolution of text messages in healthcare, early on it was primarily used between nurses and physicians. With that said, text communication in healthcare has been undervalued as well as underutilized, as we mentioned a few seconds ago. So here are some current numbers that I could find on use of smartphones. Uh, older adults, as you expect, do not own as many smartphones as the younger millennials. But since 2015, the numbers have increased for the 50 to 64 year olds. We saw a 21% increase from 58% to 79%. But the biggest jump was seen in the age 65 and over age group, which as we know, these are the baby boomers that are coming into retirement and are familiar with the technology. There was a 23% increase in, from 2015 to 2019. And one would expect these percentages to continue to increase as new data becomes available. So what is the problem with normal unsecured text messaging? Well, uh, the problem is that's just that, it's unsecured. Messages that include protected or patient health information, PHI, can place individuals and organizations at risk for HIPAA violations. Fines can be pretty pricey for those uh, violations. Uh, fines can range anywhere from $100 to $50,000 with a max of $1.5 million per violation. 
but I'll guarantee if your organization has a HIPAA violation, they're going to look a whole lot harder and see if they can find more uh, violations. Also, jail time is a, is a possibility for severe violations. Some people say I look good in stripes or orange, but no thanks, I don't want to be there uh, and be put to jail because I violated some of the, someone's PHI. Uh, a study in 2018 by Black Book Marketing found that 30% of doctors reported receiving unsecured messages uh, that included some form of PHI. That's the issue that we face here today, uh, especially with unsecured messaging. So secure messaging has evolved over the years. Access now can be obtained with almost any smart device or any device that has phone or internet connection. We're looking at smartphone, smartwatches, tablets, PCs, uh, and the likes. Uh, so it's very easily accessible and readily available for our patients uh, to use. So what's the benefit of secure messaging? Well, it's HIPAA compliant. That is the biggie. Secure messaging can be used by the entire care team, which can also include the patient and their family. It improves efficiency, has been shown to increase response time as well. Response times for text messages has been well documented by a lot of uh, digital marketers. On uh, the average, response time is about 90 seconds for a text message compared to about 90 minutes for an email. Text message has potential also in the healthcare industry to limit the inefficiencies of pagers. As an orthopedic surgeon here in Goshen, I still have a pager because my hospital does not allow the OR nurses to be connected to backline uh, when they're working in the OR. So when I'm scrubbed in surgery, I cannot open my backline messages, so I have a pager. So I, I try and argue with our hospital that the nurse will have to take my pager and call the number, so what's the difference with backline? Well, the problem with being paged for everyone is that you usually page to a location or to a floor, but we don't know who's calling and what it's about. What's the patient? We, we just don't know. So with secure messaging, I know the question who's sending us. This can even uh, see that, they can even see that I've actually opened the message and actually read it. So uh, the inefficiencies we're talking about is that I'm in the middle of office hours, I get paged, I leave my office uh, patient uh, in a room, I make a phone call, and all of a sudden no one knows who paged me. And then I'm holding, and then all of a sudden I hang up, I call again, the nurse calls back, and especially nowadays with the pandemic, we have nurses going into isolation rooms that are not going to come out and talk to me uh, pretty urgently. So uh, there's a lot of inefficiency with pagers. Uh, one of the things we can't do is give orders via text messaging. Uh, that is because Joint Commission and CMS have agreed that we cannot do orders via text messaging. However, hopefully this will change in the future for orders like diet, activity, but I don't see them being allowed for medication because of safety issues. So uh, what would be the business sense uh, or business case for secure messages when patients uh, uh, look like? Uh, there's a positive downstream effect to this. Uh, one would see early recognition of complications, and this could ultimately result in less emergency room visits or office visits. We have a potential, as we know, uh, that if we treat complications early, it usually results in a better outcome for our patients. And the other one is if patients like uh, the text messaging option, then they'll potential increase in word of mouth referrals to other family members or friends that, hey, this seems pretty good, they're, they're up to date with technology, uh, which could also increase surgeons and hospitals uh, volume as well as dollars for the organization. And of course, satisfied patients are, very, are less likely to sue us, which is also a big factor, uh, and we don't have to worry about the government either. So what are the negative downstream effects? Well, if patients are dissatisfied, it can result in lower satisfaction scores like HCAPs and thus lower reimbursement for your organization. An unhappy consumer will tell an average of about 11 people about their bad experience, which isn't good uh, for your reputation, and a lifelong loss of one household's health care expenses to a hospital or physician or physician group has been documented to be about $2.5 million by Morrissey in 2012. However, there's a dichotomy going on here. Patients would love to have 24-7 access, 
but physicians really don't want to give that up. They want to have their private time as well. But just like anything else, it's all about location and choice. Where I practiced, my home phone number was in a local phone book for over 20 years before it was removed. In a small town like I practice, patients will usually find one way or another to get a hold of me. And once in a while, my wife had to answer the phone and uh, refer patients to the office. But for the most part, it, it's not too inconvenient, and it depends where you're at. If you're in a small town, they know how to get a hold of you. If you're in a mid-sized town, you may want to use this, but you can also uh, use secure messaging to uh, sign it to your partner when they're uh, on call. So there are ways of getting around this, but uh, again, we don't want to give them 24-7 access, but they're demanding it. So it is a dichotomy that we have to deal with in the future as well. So what happened? Well, I, I completed a master's capstone project, and I was able to convince my orthopedic group to assist me in studying using backline with their patients. The study was designed to use secure messaging with our post-operative orthopedic patients at our hospital. We wanted to see if we can improve our care and communication, especially around the perioperative period. So this was important for us, and we thought backline uh, secure messaging could assist us with that. So our study overview, the study was a couple years old now, but with the pandemic, it provided our group with a good foundation on how we could communicate with our patients and families over the last year and a half. So this was actually a good thing for us to do, and it gave us experience on how we wanted to communicate with our patients. So the overview, basically, we have four-person hospital employed orthopedic group. We have two nurse practitioners with us. We utilize the backline enterprise from Dr. First. We're a 123-bed facility. All orthopedic surgical case at the hospital was, were counted, basically, inpatient, outpatient, elective, and emergent. And we used two 30-day study periods of control and pilot group, each with consecutive patients. But we did not want to take this over to the ambulatory care center just because things would get a little more complicated in the study. So we decided to just leave it at the hospital because we do both inpatient and outpatient uh, cases there uh, anyway. So we set up two non-validated surveys. Uh, one was they're completed basically at the first post-operative office visit. Our control study had 18 questions. Our pilot had 25 questions. And with our pilot, we were trying to find a few questions that may be able to be used in comparison to the Prescani validated satisfaction survey. So this was important. Uh, for us to try and see if we, we're going to improve our Prescani scores, uh, which, which is important for our hospital uh, and for our group. So what did the project provide? It provided an avenue for secure text messaging with our patients or caregiver. It's definitely a commonly used method to communicate, and it was pretty familiar with the patients. It was a 24-hour availability, so the patients did get their 24-7 uh, availability of the physician. We were able to take photographic uh, images, uh, especially in a post-operative period if there were some questions with wounds. And it was a patient-centered bi-directional chat. We can communicate back and forth uh, on a regular basis. And again, it's also real time. The only time I told them I couldn't communicate is if I was in surgery. So that was something that uh, they felt very comfortable with. And it was a very easy way to exchange any information between the physician and the doctor itself. So here's our study. Uh, basically, uh, we had a control group, uh, and about 84% of the potential patients were enrolled, and 91% potential patients uh, enrolled during our pilot program. The control group had 44 females and 18 males, and the pilot had 41 males and 33 females. Average age for the patients were about 56 for the control group and 59 for the pilot group. The majority of our patients that did not enroll did not have a phone or had a, did not have, or had a phone without texting capabilities. We're in an area where there's quite a few Amish, popu uh, Amish people, and the Amish population tend not to have phones, uh, but uh, we also had an elderly population as well. So as we saw on the one slide with the usage of smartphones, the older population was not as proficient in using smartphones or even owning smartphones. So uh, that's important to think about when we look at our, our project. So the project was actually pretty easy. It was very easy to enroll our patients or caregivers. We basically opened up the backline uh, app uh, and selected the external user op option. We basically 
simply place the phone number in the pop-up box that you see there in the middle uh, and place, uh, place it there and send. Uh, the person would get a link. Uh, they would have to identify who they are, and then they would hit send. Uh, we're then active, basically communicating for the next 72 hours. Our organization elected to use 72 hours as a time frame that this would remain open, but that is up to your organization and that can be changed for a longer period of time or even a shorter period of time. Once the message is sent, the 72 hour window is reset. So if I communicate with someone on, at the 71st hour, then it'll reset for another three days. So uh, you can keep continually sending messages as long as you communicate with that 72 hour window. I do a lot of total joint replacements in my practice, and a lot of times the patients are taken back to a holding area well before the surgery start time. So this is because they want to do peripheral nerve blocks, anesthesia wants to spend time with the patient and get them ready for the surgery. So family would think, oh, my, my, my parent or my spouse just went back to the OR, it'll be about an hour and a half for the surgery. Well. That's not true, it could be two and a half or three hours, and then when you come out, they usually say, what took so long? So I would send a text messages uh, to whoever we signed up, whether it be the spouse or another caregiver, stating we're about to begin surgery. So they were a little more comfortable that I give them a time limit, usually about 70 to 90 minutes for, for the surgery, for the total joint, and now they would be a little bit more comfortable knowing that it's not taking three hours for them to uh, get out of surgery. So the other thing is when I left the OR, I was able to send another quick little message that says, we are done, we'll be out in a few minutes. So if some of you folks have family members like we do, they basically leave the waiting area, they'll go out for a smoke, they go out to pick up their child, uh, and, and they leave the area. So many a times I've gone out there and basically uh, asked for the family members and nobody was there. So this also gives them a signal to get back to the waiting area so they they can talk to the physician. So having that little capability definitely improve communication uh, and uh, talk about delays. Uh, however, during this pandemic, it was very helpful and we were able to use this kind of information to keep the families informed. And again, once discharged, we were able to communicate via the text messages with the family uh, when they went home, uh, especially during that perioperative period, which is pretty critical. Uh, uh, for for a successful surgery as well as successful outcomes for our patients. So on our study, 72.4% of the people in a baseline group said they would enroll in a secure messaging process that was available. So we asked them before we even did the pilot, would you be interested? And they said, sure. And then 80.9% of the patient or caregiver enrolled in a text messaging program during a pilot program. I think that was a pretty good number. Uh, and most of them were really patients between the age of 55 and 65. So that was about 59% of our patients and 36% of our patients enrolled were over 65. So uh, still a good number. And, and again, I think this number goes to a group that uh, don't have as many smartphones as the younger folks. So uh, these numbers would probably be a higher uh, if our average patient uh, uh, age was a little bit lower. So people are going to ask, you know, why do uh, patients call the doctor's office before their post-op visit? So we wanted to do this with our control group because we wanted to see what were some of the common reasons for the call. Of course, typically pain medication was the number one reason, or uh, followed by appointment questions, dressings, or incisional areas. And there were other ones as, as well, uh, numbness, exercise, constipation, nausea. So patients would call for multiple reasons, and sometimes it would be over a weekend and they'd have a hard time getting a hold of anybody other than going through the service, which a lot of times they do not do, they just suffer. So we wanted to see what kind of questions were they gonna to pose to us when we basically were talking uh, or texting back and forth. So we look at top, top box results. For people that don't know what this is, this is basically refers to a positive response in any survey. On a zero to 10 scale, nines and tens are top box responses. So those are very good. And in our organization, nine and tens are what they really count on. Uh, if you go to a Ford dealer, they're gonna say, hey, if you can't give us a 10, you know, why? What can we do to make it better? Well, in healthcare, we try not to do this. We try and get an unbiased opinion uh, as well as having them complete the survey without any bias. 
Uh, and then if you have a yes or no question, yes is also a top box response. So when we first look at this, uh, we look at how satisfied uh, was the time it took for the surgeon to respond to the calls. It was 83.8%. That was actually pretty good. And then we asked how easy was it to use the secure messaging when we contacted the surgeon. That was 90% top box results. So that's also very good. And how easy was it to use was 84.4. So not only was it convenient, it was easy to use, and they got pretty good access. Then we look down a little bit further. Uh, were they satisfied how long it took us to respond to our text? Again, educating the patient that you may be scrubbed in surgery was very important, but we got an 80% positive top box response. And how satisfied were they the fact that they could communicate with the surgeon? And that was 83%. Again, pretty good numbers. And then would you recommend it to family and friends? Nine out of 10 people would recommend it to family and friends. And did text messaging make you more relaxed? Almost 83% of the people said it did. And did have text messaging option improve your care experience? Close to 80% as well. So then we tried to look at some things with Prescani. Uh, and we look at things with Prescani. We look at uh, in, their, in their survey, they'll talk about keeping a patient informed about things and how would you consider your overall experience? So those were two of the main questions that we looked at when we're gonna try and compare Prescani scores to our top box responses, and that Prescani uses a top, top box response as well. So when you look at these numbers a little different way, uh, it's a little bit more graphic. So when we see improved overall experience, 77.8% of the people felt that it improved their overall experience, and then uh, it also made them more relaxed. 82.6% of the respondents said that, and they would recommend it to family and friends. So 90% of the people would recommend this type of uh, service, the text messaging option, with family and friends. Well, then we're going to look at our Prestini scores here a little bit. As you see, the end numbers aren't very large, but there are times all organizations struggle to get responses back. Uh, but here are the responses for two months of the study, both inpatient and ambulatory surgery at our hospital. Remember, the study did not include our ASC. Uh, the important things that stand out to us or me was the information about delays in the outpatient unit. It was 60%. And inpatient combined between the nurses and physician was also about 60%. And recommending the hospital or center was a little over 80%. So... You know, we definitely can do better, and I think all organizations will struggle with some of these things at times. Even though you explain things to patients, they still sometimes think that they're not giving, being transparent or you're not giving them information, especially about delays. So, so as we, we looked at these numbers, basically you look at our pilot study using uh, secure messaging. We got almost a 90% response rate compared to 60% uh, for the Prescani scores for keeping our patients informed of delays. I think a lot of it happened to do around the perioperative period like I talked about, especially when people go back to the OR with blocks where they think surgery is about ready to begin, but in reality, they're back there sometimes for an hour, an hour and a half earlier than we actually start. So I, I think a lot of this could have been that, but again, keeping our patients informed uh, or family members informed was a critical part of our study, and, and this is something we learned from. So we nearly had a 50% improvement on the average patient experience metrics, which was keep informed of delays. So, so that is very, very important and, and is a key part of this study. The other areas we're trying to compare to Prescani was uh, likely to recommend a service hospital to a family or friend, and the overall assessment. They all came out about 80%. So there was really no uh, statistically significant change, unlike we had here for the informed delays with a P of 0 0.008. So uh, from a statistically significant findings, the only thing we really saw in our study was that we definitely improved keep informed of delays. But one of the important things we got out of this was basically our qualitative written comments. Uh, there, there's just a few of these uh, that we wrote down. Uh, they're basically from patients from uh, the pilot study, the baseline, I'm sorry, the baseline study as well as the pilot study. And then we have physicians and nursing commenting on 
what we saw. So on the baseline study, uh, basically we didn't have the, the text messaging option, but uh, one of the comments stated a direct line of communication to the surgeon would be great. So being available is very important to patients, especially when it's surgery, because surgery can be a critical time for these patients, and it's very stressful for them. And then we look at the pilot group from patients, extremely helpful. I use it for questions for the doctor while I was in the hospital. So we keep our patients sometimes overnight from a total joint. And even after I do rounds in the morning, sometimes I'll get a text message from the patient uh, asking me a question, and I could very easily just respond back to them without having a nurse having to page me or call me. It's nice to use text messages instead of phone calls sometimes. I took pictures of my knee. It saved me a trip to the office. It gave me comfort to know that the doctor cared enough to give me these options. And there's other, uh, did not use it, uh, but was happy it was available, created a sense of being connected to care, uh, great option but not needed this time, great idea. So we definitely got a lot of positive responses from our patients, and I think that, that is really critical for the stu study because we're, we're relying on our patient satisfaction, and, and we have to look at some of these uh, as a qualitative uh, comment, not necessarily quantitative like we did with the informed delay. So as we look a little further, uh, we have some nursing comments. Uh, and remember, our, and probably in your organization too, the nurses will call our patients postoperatively to see how they're doing and check up on them and see if there's any questions or anything. So when our nurses started calling our, uh, our pilot uh, patients, they noted there was less questions when they did their post-op checks the next day. They said the patients were very happy. They can contact the surgeons uh, with questions when they went home. Uh, the patients liked that they could text the doctor instead of calling the office. Uh, so these are just some comments from the nurses. Uh, they thought it was a nice option, uh, and it made their life a little bit easier as well. So they didn't have to be on the phone as long, so it improved their, their workflow as well. And then we had some comments from the physician. Photo capability was great, probably saved emergency room and extra office visits, which is what we do. If patient sees a swollen uh, joint, a red joint, something like that, or an area where surgery was, they just take a picture and we can actually assess it instantaneously. So that was very, very good uh, for our patients as well as our staff because we're able to uh, uh, have other patients in that appointment spot instead of working these people in that were postoperatively that they think they had some complications. It also, they comment, allow patient to contact the physician when there was a problem at the pharmacy. So during our uh, issues with uh, opioids, there are a lot of times that the patients would go over to the pharmacy to pick up their prescription, which we sent via uh, e-prescribing from Dr. First. And lo and behold, they get to the pharmacy and they don't have that, that pain medicine. Well, the pharmacist never tries to track us down. They just wait for the patient to show up. So. It could be two, three hours after surgery. Now the patient is starting to hurt a little bit, and they go to the family goes to pick up their, their medication, and it's not there. So one of the things that we, ha we had them do was just send us a text message. So they sent us a nice text message saying the medication wasn't available, and I would ask them, give me the phone number to the pharmacy, and I would call the pharmacist to see what's was available. And sometimes I was just able to change my prescription, or other times I'd have to send it to a different pharmacy. So being immediately contacted by the patient was much easier than them trying to go through the operator, talk to the physician on call, tracking down the nurse that took care of them, because it could be a long time before they get to the answer uh, that they're looking for or the person they're looking for, and lo and behold, now the pharmacy's closed. So uh, it really helped our patients when they sat at the pharmacy when they didn't have the medication, so we were able to do things relatively quickly. So we were real happy about that. Now, there was a couple issues that our physicians didn't like about this, and I'm not going to uh, beat around the bush with this, but because it's a one-on-one -on -one external user contact, the person that initiated the conference, let's say it's me, will always get that text message. I cannot forward it to my, my partner on call. So during this study, since they agreed to be on 24-7, a couple times they got calls in the middle of the night, and they happened to be not on call. So in normal circumstances, they would have got a phone call from the patient in the middle of the night if you're on call. But if you weren't on call, you wouldn't have known about it. So they didn't like that as much. 
and we they had one patient that sent multiple messages in the middle of the night, which they weren't real happy about. Again, it would have been someone else that was on call. But for the most part, it's definitely not abused. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The patient did not abuse the opportunity to call us in most cases. So what are our results? Well, with the overwhelming positive response from the patients, nurses, and physicians, I think this study gave us significant credibility and acceptance for recommending the increased use of secure text messaging in healthcare. When secure text messaging was made available to patients, 83% were very satisfied or extremely satisfied that they could communicate with their surgeon. 82.6% of the respondents felt also more relaxed. And almost 78% of the patients felt it improved their overall care experience. And again, 90% of the patients would recommend to family and friends the use of secure text messaging the next time they required surgery. So I, I think it was a plus. Uh, and, and it gave us a lot of information about our patients and what they want and what their needs are. So uh, additional results, our study demonstrated a manageable number of phone call uh, or text message from patients during the perioperative period. Uh, many of the patients did not report or reported they did not even message the surgeon. And a few would send one or two messages and only, I believe, three uh, was sent more than uh, three or more times uh, during that perioperative period. So we had a few that didn't even respond to the question. It appears that the patients didn't abuse it, uh, and it's something that we continue to use, uh, and uh, we still see that happening. It doesn't get abused. But there are some patients that, you know, you might not want to give the text messaging option to them, uh, and they'd have to go through the operator and page us. And it also didn't disrupt providers' workflow. I was on call last week, and on Friday, I counted 22 backline messages. And some of those times, I was in the OR. Sometimes I was in office. And to answer a message, again, without having to try and call someone, figure out who's calling, why they're calling, it was definitely more efficient. And the emergency room physician would, would send the message very easily and then even send a picture uh, of an X-ray or, or a, let's say, an inflamed elbow that I can make a decision almost instantaneously whether to uh, see them in the office, uh, follow up with uh, my nurse practitioner, or I need to come in there, reduce it, or put them on uh, the surgery schedule. So uh, we're able to communicate a little bit better using backline, especially with the picture option, the photographic option. Uh, and during our study, we did several photographs from patients, and none of them really had to have any additional office visits, emergency room visits, or antibiotics but it also gave the satisfaction that everything is okay and they were able to show us pictures. And we can keep these pictures and put them in our EMR so that we have something to compare to when someone else would look at them down the road uh, or even the next week. So in conclusion, uh, healthcare organizations and providers are embracing more digital technologies to connect with patients through telehealth and the internet. And of course, the pandemic accelerated a lot of these. Uh, patients were also demanding instant access and looking into technology to receive it. By using secure messaging with patients, we can provide organization providers with another method to connect to today's patients. The study has definitely demonstrated that secure messaging can make a positive impact on patient satisfaction and we can enhance the patient experience. So as a, this was a couple years ago and the pandemic has done uh, a wrench into a lot of the way we do things, but I just wanted to go over some present day usage that we use here at Goshen. Uh, our nurses on the floor tend to use Zebra phones and the providers and nursing administrators would bring your own device. So that's how we have it set up in our organization. And of course, uh, the uh, paperwork and policies all have to be written appropriately. Uh, I'm looking here now at this slide and one of the things I forgot was nurse to nurse nurse to physician providers. So uh, these are important things because nurses typically initiate the first text message about a patient. So uh, we see uh, nurses to provider, then a provider to nurse usually responds to that question. And the good thing is if you do rounds, you may know what nurses take care of your patients. So you can definitely send messages to that nurse. And then nurse to nurse, when someone goes on break or when someone is uh, off the floor for whatever reason, they can assign that message to uh, the nurse that's covering. Uh, provider to patient, like we described, I can send a message to them. Nurse to patient, if they wanted to, they could connect to the patient. 
and our home care and hospice people and care managers do that uh, occasionally. And of course, provider to provider. So for us, it's not just in the hospital use. We have several uh, non-hospital uh, medical groups, and sometimes we get urgent phone calls, uh, and we use the back line to, to send pictures, x-rays for us to see the patient where we can make assessments, like I said, on the fly, as opposed to trying to track down the physician that's on call. So provider provider is very uh, common that we use uh, within our organization. So if you think about our office, how did things change us a little bit? Well, we still communicate provider to provider, uh, and I can send a message securely to my medical assistant about a patient that I just operated on, having to make a new appointment or something else. But our triage nurse is, is critical for this because they receive all the phone calls coming into our office, and if there is definitely a question about an incision, they have them take their, their, their picture of that and we can see it almost instantaneously. Then a triage nurse would send it to us. And of course, we can always respond back to the, to the patient. And in our hospital, again, the nurse uh, to provider, 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 uh, ED uh, to the provider, ASC, our uh, ambulatory surgery care, as well as the urgent care uh, to the provider, a nurse to patient, to our caregivers. Uh, again, similar to what we've done in our study, uh, hospice and our care management department uses this quite a bit with their patients, and more importantly, our case managers communicating with the physicians uh, that are taking care of the patient. In the hospital, there is a capability of having a group uh, set up per patient, but we elected not to do that because you would have the nurse, the physical therapist, you would have the respiratory therapist, you may have the social worker all on this same uh, patient, and as a physician, I don't want to see all the internal pages that are going back and forth or texts going back and forth. So we've elected not to utilize it, but it is available if we wanted to use it. Uh, but the physicians have decided not to use it within our hospital. So for surgery, how does this change things? Well, the scheduler at the desk of surgery will let us know updates on people running behind. Are we early? With, what's the scoop? It keeps us updated on how things are going. Uh, I can communicate with my scrub tech or the nurse that's going to be in the room with me today. Uh, I can talk to the family postoperatively and preoperatively like I discussed. The nurse to the patient postop, uh, they are sometimes communicating via text messaging uh, with the patient's postop instead of making a phone call as well as, as we discussed, the staff to patient communication. Similar, sending them a message, hey, and don't forget to be NPO tonight, uh, don't forget your HIPAA shower. So there are some things that we can do with that and we'll discuss a little bit more uh, later. So I believe it's possible for organizations to improve patient quality and satisfaction by enhancing care coordination across the entire continuum of healthcare. One of the ways to look at this, if we can improve every touch point that the patient has to go through, then we'll be have a more satisfied patient. This can be accomplished by using a communication platform similar to Backline. Dr. First has recently coined a term, healthyverse. And what they describe this as their vision of a United Healthcare universe where everyone is connected in real time to each other and to the information they need. So patients can get the best care where and when they need it. The healthy verse galaxy, as I describe it, will include patients, medical professionals, caregivers, hospitals, pharmacies, EHRs, payers, health information exchange, pharmaceutical companies, and many, many other organizations or part of the organizations to allow us to help our patients and give them all the information they need to be taken care of. So right before the pandemic struck, our, our health system was looking into expanding some of the backline capabilities, but the back pandemic basically put a, a little uh, wrench into that uh, process. So during this time and even a little bit before that time that we're looking at, there's been significant developments in Backline and Dr. First as they strive towards the mission of Healthy Verse, as we just described. I can give you a little tidbit on these uh, new developments, but uh, at the end of this uh, 
presentation, there'll be contact information for Dr. First if you have additional questions. So under telehealth and with the pandemic, we know that quite a few uh, companies have pushed for their telehealth. But one of the nice things that Dr. First will do is you could actually have multiple users on the visit. So besides the patient on your visit, you could have additional family members or caregivers, social worker, interpreters. All these people could be on the call at the same time. And one of the issues we have across the country is connectivity because a lot of times you're on a telehealth visit and people lose uh, connection and it's not very satisfying for either the uh, provider or the patient. They have wh what they call an initiator uh, where they, or the, I'm sorry, uh, where they can, the initiator can visit uh, the strength, so the signal strength uh, of the telehealth visit. They can determine real time if the strength is appropriate, do they need to reconnect, and how else they can help the patient. So real time, they can monitor the strength of this connection so that they're able to make sure they have a great uh, signal when they are doing their telehealth visit. Because one of the worst things you do is halfway through the visit, it, you lose it and you don't really get through and you have to do all over again. So some of the other things that they developed was automatic notifications, like we talked about appointment reminders. You can have canned messages that the organization can tailor to what they need. You can send messages about reminders for NPO besides their appointment, pre-op reminders such as HIVACLEN shower, as I stated, and what time to show up for their surgery. These are all things that they have capabilities of doing. Under medication history, uh, one of the things now that you can do is scan a person's driver's license and receive a current medication list. This has been employed in the field to assist first responders as well as ER staff when patients are unable to provide uh, that information. Admission, discharge, and transfer notification can be used by providers to follow their patients through their journey or for nursing supervisors who may use them to receive timely updates so decisions can be made for something like bed management or even staffing requirements for certain units. Ticketing function, the way I look at this, it's sort of a call center or a message board for different individuals where they can send messages within the department. For instance, hospice and home care probably would utilize this on a regular basis. When you have a hospice or home care nurse going out to see a patient, uh, there may be some change in the status of the patient where they can now put a little notification in this uh, message or call center so that the next nurse coming out will have a better idea of what's going on with the patient or what has changed or what has to be done. So anyone that is enrolled in this ticketing functionality or call center can view these uh, messages uh, on, a, on a timely basis and to make sure that they can give updates of patient status. And then the multi-organizational capabilities pertains to basically being able to push information to individuals outside the organization. So for me as an orthopedic surgeon, one of my referrals is to a rheumatologist. So I can send information to that rheumatologist without having to go through fax machines uh, or email. I can just send some of the pertinent information that I'd like to see my, have or see my patient uh, timely. Uh, and right now there's a six-month six wait for our rheumatologist appointment. So sometimes I can get these people in a little bit earlier uh, or I can get uh, some additional information what I could do to treat them. Uh, this is done without requiring them to have any licensing fees or uh, uh, fees for this. And then I, I believe opportunities for new and improving process will only be limited to the imagination of the user. So some of these things that we use now uh, no one thought about these until they start using backline. So uh, backline, you know, you can use it any way you want, and uh, it's really up to your imagination how you would be able to use it. So uh, I'm going to wait for some questions, and here is the contact information myself as well as for uh, Hasib. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, David, for that fantastic presentation. We'll now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see in your dashboard. We'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for. Uh, David, uh, first question coming in, um, how many phone calls or text messages do you get post-operatively from your patients? 
Well, first, I would sometimes initiate the, the conversation, like per stop day number one, I would say, how's it going? And they would respond, fine. But looking back at the question uh, or how many times they messaged us, I believe it was 42 out of like 62 patients that responded to the question. Didn't even send us a message. They were fine. There was no reason to text us, and they didn't initiate any calls. But there was just a handful of people that would call two or, or send a message two or three times. And like I said earlier, there was probably two patients that uh, used it three or four times. But that was about it. So from uh, one of the things that our physicians commented about was, eh, we didn't get bothered as much as we thought we would. So even though it's available, I don't think patients abuse it. Got it, got it. That's super helpful to understand. Um, another audience member asks, how well do the ER and urgent care communicate? Well, prior to using Backline, they would, they would page us. We would have to call them, figure out what they wanted, try and go to a computer, look at the x-rays in most cases, and come up with a solution, which could take 15, 20 minutes sometimes, especially if you're in a car or you're not close to a computer. So what we've actually done and worked real hard with the ER and urgent care would be to send us a little brief message, but send us a picture of the x-ray uh, within the message uh, or a picture of an elbow. I had an infected elbow over the weekend. They sent me a picture, and all it did was say, okay, you have a moral antibiotics, I'll see it next week. So what we've done is made it very efficient for the physician who is getting the, the text message to make a decision almost instantaneously. So I can look at what the history was, I can look at what's wrong, I can look at the x-ray, and lo and behold, I can say, okay, just put in a split, we'll see it in the office next week, or oh, I need to come in and do a, a close reduction, or that needs to be admitted. So it definitely has improved our efficiency, our response rates are very quick to the, to the uh, uh, person that sent it, like the ER, the urgent care, so they're very happy that they have ways that they can actually communicate with us and we can get back to them very quickly. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you so much, David. Um, next question coming in we have is, what things have made your practice more efficient? Well, I think just from the, the previous question, I mean, if I'm on call, you know, having those text messages with the pictures, you know, it makes my life a whole lot easier, especially if I'm driving home or whatever. I can just pull over real quickly and, and respond. Uh, so that has made it very efficient. The other thing was is actually having pictures of, of uh, uh, incisions if there's any questions or any problems. So it gives us an opportunity to make a, a split decision on what we're seeing without having to have the patient come in. They're the emergency room. So number one, we're saving healthcare costs but we're also saving the patient's time as well as my time where I can actually efficiently use this. And the nice thing is I don't have to respond immediately if it's not an emergency issue. It's, I can respond quick or I can respond something that may not be urgent uh, by using the text messaging. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, next question we have, David, is how did secure messaging impact your practice? Again, I think it goes on the line that we talked about. It, it's nice having everybody connected uh, in your office, especially if you have, I have one MA, a primary medical assistant, and I can send her messages of what's happening in the hospital. So over the weekend, I had six or seven surgeries, so I needed post-op appointments. I wanted her to look at them, so I was able to put the uh, patient health information, who they were, what's the date of birth, and allow them to make an appointment for those patients and then send me that information that I could give to the hospital uh, as a post-op visit. So the, it's efficient across the board besides emergency room and uh, urgent care as well as within our office. So there's many capabilities. It also allows the nurses on the floor on the, in the surgery or at the ASC to call me, give me updates because we're not a huge hospital where we have, you know, everybody has a block time all day. Sometimes there's a surgery, I'm following somebody, but a lot of times they're late. I don't want to have to run to the hospital and sit there and then be mad because I'm an hour late, as opposed to I could be doing something different. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, next question is, do you see this being able to grow to the point that we eliminate pagers? 
Oh, absolutely. I, I would love to have our hospital have the paging uh, eliminated, but it will it take, for surgeons at least, you can't be scrubbed and use backline because I cannot give the nurse my PIN number and things like that because that's a HIPAA violation. What I'd love to do is have the OR nurse on backline so that I can assign my messages when I'm scrubbed to her. So yes, there is definitely a way to do that, but surgeons, it's a little tricky, and I believe a lot of our physicians have eliminated their pagers, but for surgeons, there is a little bit more work that has to be done. Okay, got it. That's super helpful to understand. Uh, we've got another question here coming in uh, from another audience member asks, do you use automated texts or are they free texts? Well, it's, you can do both. You can set things up based on what you want to do with your organization. Uh, but the other thing is there's also voice texting, uh, voice messaging. So if I don't want to text and I have big fingers, I don't like doing that, I'll just hit the the, the microphone button and I'll speak my text just like I'm talking here and then a person doesn't have to read it they're going to hear it so uh, there are some canned text but there's also free text but the other option is you just voice you know record it and then send that to the pay, to the person that's asking questions and a lot of time that works very well all right thank you so much Dave for the clarification there um, another question coming in here from an audience member for extensive interactions with the physical, is the patient billed for any service related to a secure message session? No, we haven't done that, but you know, with some of the waivers that have been taken uh, recently with the pandemic, you know, other organizations have used some of these things, but I've not, we're not, I'm not familiar with text messaging being billed for that service, but phone calls are now and things like that. But the, one of the advantage of this extensive uh, uh, communication that you're talking about, you can actually have the administrators take that conversation and actually put it in a chart. And that's the other advantage is 10 years from now, because it's sort of stored in the cloud, if you are sued, you could actually grab some of those conversations you had uh, uh, with the patient or whomever and actually have that put in text, and you can have that in your chart to prove what you've done. So I can't say our organization has done that, but I'm not sure that'd be something maybe that Dr. First or Backline could give you some information on. Got it, for sure. Thank you so much, David. And well, it looks like that's all the, the time we have for today. I want to thank David for that excellent presentation and Dr. First for sponsoring today's webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day. and We look forward to having you join us for future Becker's webinars.